All right. Hi, everyone. I think it's time to get started. Welcome to the MIT Robotics Seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me. So grab food and, and rush like, you know, to find a seat here. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Mirko Kovac. Uh, Mirko is a full professor at Imperial College London, where he leads the Area Robotics Laboratory. And he's also the director of the Laboratory of Sustainability Robotics at the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology in Zurich. Uh, before his appointment in London, he was actually pretty close to us. He was working at Harvard with uh, Rob Wood, and he got his PhD from EPFL. Uh, his research focuses on novel mobile robots for uh, distributed sensing and autonomous manufacturing in natural environments. Um, Mirko's particular speciali specialization is in robot design, hardware development, and multimodal sensor mobility. Um, I was chatting with Mirko, something that really stands out uh, from Mirko's work is really the creativity of the design of the robots is going to show, and also the attention to the societal impact of robotics. So if you speak with Mirko for a few minutes, it's quite clear that you know, he's really passionate about <coughs> robotics, but it's equally uh, clear that uh, he wants to improve society as a key driver of the work he's doing, rather than being an afterthought of the work he's doing, which is great. So Mirko has won several uh, Best Paper Awards, has delivered over 100 keynotes and invited lectures. Uh, he's also regularly um, playing the role of advisor for government, investment funds, and industry uh, about robotics. And without taking too much time, let's welcome Mirko. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's a great pleasure meeting you all. And so I'm very excited about this talk and to be here today for two reasons. One is that I spent some time here as a postdoc, which was now almost 12, 13 years ago, which is quite a while. But um, I really love the energy in the space, in the talking to people, seeing the city, and so how everyone thinks about robotics and how integrated everything is. And the second reason why I'm excited is that I can show a picture like this, starting a robotic talk, and nobody seems outraged. So nobody left the room yet. And so why am I showing this? So I'm showing this uh, bee. It's a bee. It's not a robot. Uh, because um, it's really like the holy grail of robotics. Right? The holy grail being the lifelike nature of the system that is able to reproduce, to live in an outside environment, um, have the growing capability, self-healing capability, and autonomous cap capability. So at some point, we'll be able to build things like this that are lifelike. And I hope that together as a community, we can really create impact in sustainability to make the world a better place. So I hope that this talk will give a bit of an overview how we can do it, what are the impact scenarios, how we can create um, those type of systems. Now, this uh, video here is um, Thomas Creedy. And Thomas Creedy was uh, the second PhD student, I think, when I started at Imperial. And Thomas was an ecologist at that time. And the idea was, or the grant that we uh, um, had for this, was to use robots and place sensors in forest environments. And this is in the Honduras uh, rainforest in 2013, uh, where we tried to use those off-the-shelf type of uh, drones to do this type of monitoring. But it was really hard. It was hard because, um, first, the autonomy was not there yet. So the community didn't develop it, actually, at that point fully yet. The second was that the forest moves. So everything moves, right? There's light, illumination changes. There's no GPS inside of the dense and forest. There's a structure that moves all the time. So it's extremely difficult, changing, unpredictable environment. So this project, we didn't deliver the full sensor placing capability, but it uh, made us sensitive to some of the issues that uh, we are facing if you want to do that. And so since then, um, we'll be, we have been working on new types of robots for those type of environments. And today, the mission uh, of the laboratory is to create um, minimal invasive robotics and AI technologies to measure and modify environments and deliver sustainable outcomes. So basically, sensing and actuation to the environment using lifelike robots. What kind of sustainable outcomes? This is linked here from forest health, but also to aging assets. So pipelines, bridges, and so on, smart cities, climate monitoring, water health. These are big topics where robotics and AI can uh, contribute. In fact, the question is whether it can is still an open question. So the hypothesis is that when we build lifelike robots, we can provide this data at a higher spatial temporal resolution and a lower cost and risk compared to established methods. 
So this, I hope, um, is the case, and I hope that some of our work can actually outline and um, validate this hypothesis. The questions we need to study is, for example, how bioinspired inspired principle can, can enhance mobility or construction, how body metamorphosis can enable multimodality, or how robots, robotics and AI in general can address this United Nations sustainability, sustainable development goals. So I think it's a multi-level um, approach to asking those questions and uh, validating this hypothesis. Now, if you think about robotics and um, the classical approach of how to build robots, it often starts with simulation, modeling, then controller design, then component selection, then building a robot that you know, is similar to the simulation, then testing it in the outdoor environment. So, of course, it's not fully linear, right? It's also integrated, it's circular in some way. And it often works extremely well if the environment is predictable. So you see jumping humanoids or robotic uh, quadrupeds and so on. So there's a lot of great work going on in this domain, but it becomes more difficult when the environment is hard to model. So for example, walking on sand, on gravel, in waves, in turbulence, there those type of established um, methods um, model predictive control, for example, um, becomes more difficult. So in nature, um, however, the approach is probably very different. And in fact, there's one feature of it that I want to emphasize, which is the co-evolution of the body, the controller, the sensing, and the actuators all together. It's not like it takes a human and then there's some controller coming onto it that makes it alive. It's really the growing and learning and um, change in perception and sensing and neural network that is integrated. Because of this, humans and animals have these amazing capabilities. For example, if you look at the bee itself, we see that it can fly, but not just that. It also um, can do this autonomously. It can have onboard control, sensing, navigation. It then integrates the aerodynamics, the materials, structures, actuators. And on top of all of this, it has dynamic manipulation of unknown environments, multi-terrain mobility, manufacturing, reproduction, right? So it's a a pretty amazing, I would say, right? So, so in robotics, I think we're really very far of those type of integrated, multidisciplinary kind of co-evolution of, um, of the different aspects of the robot. So let me give you an example. So um, if you, for example, you want to land on a surface, so we want to perch with the robot, we can use uh, different methods, and so on the right side, we can have a control, sensing, and planning-based approach, where we sense the environment, we plan a trajectory and attach to this. Uh, Russ Tedrick did some great work here at MIT um, a while ago. And this works if the controller is, um, is on board, if there's enough payload for a controller, if the sensors can be on board as well. But if the system becomes very small, if you get below a gram, for example, then it's very hard to sense. It's very hard to kind of predict the trajectories. And there, the benefit of using the materials and the structures or the mechanical intelligence becomes more pronounced or more valuable as well. So for example, the flies, if you look at the way how flies land on the surface is they don't necessarily plan the trajectory. They also just crash into the surface and they use the compliance of the physical body to dampen the impact and make the transition from air to the surface. So it's a combined um, sensing control and mechanical intelligence based task. And I think if you get the, want to create this life like robots, we have to benefit from both. It's not just one, it's a coevolution of them. And this coevolution of disciplines is something that I tried to outline in this paper here in 2020, um, uh, calling it skills for physical artificial intelligence, where physical AI is the development methodology of co evolving the materials, the morphology, the controllers the chemistry, the, uh, the sensory system, all together in a tightly coupled manner, and like this, develop those lifelike uh, systems. Now, in terms of impact, of course, the sustainable development goals, I think you have seen those. And robotics has a role to play on all of them or some of them. It's still an open question. I think for some of them, it is more relevant especially for life below water, life on land, uh, climate action, and so on. So collect the data and you know, act on the environment. So therefore, I will uh, structure this talk alongside those impact use, use cases, let's say, that are aligned with those United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I will walk you through on a quite high level 
um, through some of the projects, trying to outline what uh, we can do and what are the kind of buy inspire principles we can benefit from in those fields. Okay, so the first one I would like to show is the idea to have robots that would live in, an, in a forest and in a natural environment and sense this environment. So this is important for estimating biomass, for example, or extreme event monitoring, um, biodiversity quantification, ash dieback estimation. So ash dieback is uh, something that affects ash trees where they lose the leaves and it's a big problem for ash trees and in ecology. And all of their, in those type of use cases, robotics can make a difference. So there are different ways how robots could place sensors or could sense the environment from visual sensing to placing the sensors, as you see here, to shooting sensors or perching like spiders. And this variety of locomotion modes can really provide the data that is valuable. One example is vision-based uh, flight. And here it's a, it's a piece of work that we did based on data sets, so labeled tree density or ground loss estimation. So there's this density data that you have from WSL, which is a scientific institute um, in Switzerland that focuses on forests, for, um, for example. And so they have labeled a lot of those data and to uh, quantify how much density of the, leaf, um, of the leaves is there, of the trees. And so we have then extended this with a, with a uh, synthetic data set that you see here using a game engine, so Unity game engine and then trained a neural network to do an online estimation of the, of the density of the trees. Like this, we have two methods, one which is an absolute, one which is a relative method, and basically allows us to use video data to then quantify the density of, those, uh, of the leaves of those trees. So eventually, the drone can fly through a forest and map or quantify the density fully autonomously at a speed that is unmatched compared to any kind of human uh, method of doing that, or human or manual method to doing that. An important key part in this is to use a synthetic data set to augment the label data set, because often the labeling is very time intensive and difficult to do. Okay, so that's the visual sensing, but what if you want to attach to the surface, sense on the surface? So there, we can also look into different autonomy methods, and one famous method that the insects use is called optic flow divergence, or optic flow-based autonomy. And optic flow divergence is basically the expansion field, so it's the velocity over the distance ratio, and this has been used to estimate um, the distance to the surface. So you can fly, basically. You looked at the divergence in the visual field, and this can be used as a threshold to estimate when, where the surface is, right? Because it's proportional to the distance. But this works fine if the surface is flat, but if the surface is um, three-dimensional, like here, Right? It becomes very difficult, and you have a false alarm eventually because the visual field um, actually doesn't pick up uh, very well the 3D representation of the environment. So we then uh, integrated something that we call the fixtures wall hypothesis, where we use a common filter and the model input, which is all this optic flow divergence, as well as the accelerometer data on the vehicle, to then get an estimate on the actual distance, even if the environment is three-dimensional. Then we can build those robots that are palm-sized, have about 10, 20 grams of electronics, and still allows them to fly autonomously through the forest, uh, detecting the obstacles like um, bushes, and uh, go through openings, detect trees, and fly basically with a relatively high level of autonomy using those type of minimally, kind of very inexpensive computational methods using this optic flow divergence. So it's a kind of an instinct-based approach to doing it rather than trying to map everything and then plan the trajectory as uh, typically one would do in robotics. So we can then integrate also um, a tactile aspect to this and integrate um, a way how they can engage with the environment by using soft sensors in addition to the uh, kind of visual um, uh, kind of computational methods and then have this multi-sensory feedback that allows them to eventually move through very complex environment, engage with moving objects and so on, which again is done here at a, only about 10 to 20 grams of electronics. So it's a very cheap method computationally to do that. Okay, so what if um, it's even that is too much? What if you cannot even select or sense this uh, type of environments? Or what if you have the limitation on those very low resolution sensors and there are certain things you cannot pick up. For that, we looked into this, uh, in, with this paper, into uh, crash resilience. 
So having a platform that has an origami structure around, which is decoupled um, in the yaw motion, and can like this dampen the impact. So in fact, it does two things. So if you have a typical protector on a drone, you have the force um, acting, uh, giving a yaw moment on the platform, especially even if you have a ring around it that is rigid, the crash would be giving a yaw moment. And this yawing moment um, would be very detrimental um, for the drone because it's hard to stabilize in yaw direction on a quadcopter. And so because of that, we can decouple it and we can have this soft ring that de decreases the peak force. Again, reducing the um, kind of the impact of the crash on the platform. We can model this with uh, quasi-static assumptions and then parameterize this origami pattern. So it's based on the Miura Ori pattern. We can parameterize that and optimize it so to the vehicle kind of weight and dynamics, and then create those vehicles that are very crash resilient. So on the left side, you see a classical rigid protector, and here is this uh, uh, rotorigami system, as we call it, that decouples the yawing moment and reduces the peak force. And this allows us to move um, with contact, crashing into objects, again, at the weight of about two to three grams, being this ring itself. So I think the combination of this type of physical resilience or mechanical intelligence, a bit of a stretched word for that, but the mechanical layer of intelligence and resilience increase with a low level computational uh, data based method or perception, I think has actually quite powerful applications for small vehicles. Okay, so, but what then if we can de um, benefit from the physical adaptation of the body to do even more complex tasks in forests um, by doing, for example, full body metamorphosis and perching? And so this was the paper that came out uh, here this year, where the focus was on using a platform that morphs its body, morphs its body to attach itself to the trees, like a tree-hugging drone, if you want. So it would fly and then reconfigure in mid-flight and then attach to the tree. So this is done by using a um, layered approach, so like a composite that has an elastic element that allows the, the body to be um, actuated with a single degree of freedom and then adapting locally with a pre-tensioned layer of, um, in the composite to different uh, structures as here the tree, tree trunk. So it looks like this. So it flies, then it has an actuator that opens this triangular shape on the arm, then it kind of grabs or hugs the tree and can remain there, static, attached. We can even study the friction, so we study also at what angles it can work. It works outside too. And it's actually quite robust to the imprecision of landing, right? So even if you cannot per perfectly land, it can still work. And the next stage that we're looking at now is to do this dynamically, to actually do it out of flight. So it would jump and then use the flight momentum or the flight velocity to attach itself or to help in the attachment and the perching on the structure. So here, basically benefiting from the concept of metamorphosis or physical adaptation to simplify the control problem. Because having a control problem of attaching or perching to something that is unknown, if you would, would do that with mapping and some gripping, for example, would be very difficult, whereby this is a relatively um, easy approach of doing it and being adaptable to the uncertainty of the environment. Okay, so a second example is this. So what if you cannot access the tree? What if the, uh, the, the branch? What if there is uh, foliage, foliage around the, the, the site of interest? So for this, we developed this system here that has basically a dart shooting mechanism. So it would fly, detect the, struct the structure it wants to place the sensor, and then calculate the trajectory and shoot the sensor um, with a precision of a few centimeters on a few meters distance. So it flies like this, detects a tree, and can like this calculate the trajectory, and then place the sensor actually quite precisely because the trajectory can be modeled uh, quite precisely. So this idea seems quite simple, but we were very excited about this because uh, it allows us to place sensors in areas that are hard to access. And one example is this here, combining, uh, coming back to, again to Thomas Creedy's work in 2013, and he was climbing up to place the sensors, right? So here we can have this robot, as you see, it has shot the anchor or the, the sensor, right? It's here now, attached to the tree. 
And it can be done with extremely low cost and high speed, right? You could just fly up, it shoots a couple of sensors, and can like this monitor the uh, different aspects across the height of the canopy. So then it sends certain things in the canopy and can like this, for example, quantify the biodiversity in the forest, which is a really important metric to know about the forest. So what would it uh, measure typically, right? You, could measure humidity, temperature, light irrigation, animal movements. But one modality that we used here in this work is to use um, acoustic signatures, so the bioacoustics. And this, this may, basically means having small microphones, small board that measures this, and then using machine learning based on those data sets to quantify the bird species that are heard in those different environments. And so with this method, we showed that we are able to measure differences in, in the biodiversity across the canopy on the different heights and in different locations. So there's a significant difference and having the access with the drone of doing that can actually give insights into the effect of, for example, climate change or microclimates in forests. And like this, um, having a method, basically a tool for those type of sensor placement and deployment. Okay, so now you have seen the sensors, but what if uh, we want to keep them there? What if you want to leave them there and let them biodegrade? So here is a project where we looked into biodegradable sensors and biodegradable systems that would be deployed and then be stay left there, leaving zero environmental footprint, right? So transient robots, as we would call them. Now, if you want to build those type of transient robots, um, we have to, of course, benefit from transient electronics from the whole field and there is a big opportunity there because the, um, there's a lot of um, ways how to make them the sensors and actuators biodegradable or um, kind of transient in that way. And so in this paper we try to outline how this field might develop and what are the key challenges that are there. And of course I think in the near future already now we can do temperature sensing or humidity sensing, sensing with biodegradable electronic devices but also in the long term it will be uh, pH levels or imaging devices. All of those systems will become more and more biodegradable. And so if you think about biodegradable robots or transient robots, um, they of course consist of sensors, actuators and structures, right? It's kind of what makes the robot body. And so we work um, for, a, I think about four years now on, the, on this topic. Um, looking at different methods, how we can make sensors, actuators, and structures fully biodegradable. And just to highlight a few, I'll mention one example each. And let's say if you want to think about structure, the approach that we take here is to use cellulose-based cryogels, which is basically a cellulose mix that is then combined with gelatin, for example. Um, and like this can give us this kind of uh, suspension, uh, so microfibrated cellulose suspension with starch, agar, or gelatin. Then we can pour this into a mold, deep fry, uh, freeze it, then freeze dry it. That gives us then this kind of uh, porous materials as you see here. Now the porosity and the mechanical performance of those materials can be optimized depending on the composition of how we mix them and how we process them. We can then see the Ashby plot here, so if the density with compressive strength, basically the closer to the middle line you are, the better it is in terms of performance per weight. And then we see that this type of um, combination of, I think um, it was here, gelatin and cellulose uh, is actually quite good and one of the best um, compared to similar work. And so it's a very um, useful method of how to make structurally strong, lightweight, changeable um, composites based on that that also are fully biodegradable as you see on the top right. So we started the biodegradability over time and can also accelerate that depending on how we build them and how we use different types of <coughs> triggers and um, actors to kind of change the time on the biodegradation. Okay, so the sensing we can also um, do um, on the structure and one example here is to use uh, inkjet printing or screen printing of biodegradable ink, which can, like this, allows us to make those resistive um, sensors. For example, as you see here, where the, the, the wings are coated with a skin of uh, the sensing electronics. And like this, being able to sense the deflection, as you see 
um, here to kind of get the layer of proprioception on the robot. So basically, again, fully biodegradable sensing uh, skins on the structure using uh, this uh, kind of carbon ink methods of printing them on top of the materials. In terms of actuation, an example could be uh, this humidity responsive actuators where we have, for example, these starch-based gliders, as you see here, so that they then they can be deployed. So we optimize the shape, shape with CFT, and they're inspired by those um, natural seed gliders, as you see here. And they're actually very good gliders, but the question was what kind of sensing modality and actuation we can integrate that is fully biodegradable and doesn't rely on any kind of sensing or actuation in the classical sense. So the design we did was this here, as you see, it's a, basically a humidity actuated um, composite that has a pH um, sensing chemical, so litmus, integrated in it. And so when it glides down, it, it encounters humidity and opens like a flower and exposes the pH sensor that then changes color depending on the pH level in the, of the environment. So it's just an example, but it's basically an example of how to have a system that can be deployed with the robot that then senses something interesting in the environment by having a mechanically or common environment triggered um, actuator to do that. Okay, so these are just some examples on sensing, actuation, and structure. Of course, the field uh, is very kind of emerging, I would say, and it's, there's just a few papers out there on those type of uh, kind of approaches. And I think it is still relevant because it can guide us towards this idea of transient robotics where we don't just build a robot, we use it and then we throw it away, but rather we can build it, use it, and then it would biodegrade, and then it can regrow and be used again. So basically a form of a circular economy or a life cycle for the robots. And I think the biodegradation or the dying, the death of the robot, being a natural process, and an integrated process, I think is very, very important. And I think as a field, we, uh, it's, it's good if we go in that direction. Okay, so the second example I wanted to um, show you today is the idea to have robots that would perch to the environment and do sensing around infrastructure systems. And there we looked at those guys, the spiders, and spiders are, you know, really amazing. I mean, I don't know if you're very keen to have them around you. Some people are, some less. But from a kind of intelligence point of view, they're really incredible because they are able to do tensile perching to save energy, stay aloft in three dimensions. They can use the string as a sensing apparatus, so they sit in the middle and measure the vibration, so they manufacture the sensor. And they can do this to do tethered motion to the environment, right? So they 3D print a sensor and actuator in the unknown environment using local decision making and rules of how to do that by 3D printing face changing material from their own body. That's like quite an achievement, right, to do. So we were looking into this a couple of years ago and looked into well, the question, can we use something like that? Can we have robots that would use some kind of tensile manufacturing to do perching and station holding and even actuation in the environment? And this is one of the early works uh, that we did there where we have the, cra the crazy fly based platform, so palm sized robots, again, I think 20, 30 grams weight of mass, and they can deploy a string and coil a spling, so that doesn't 3D print, but the string allows it to anchor to different environment. And like this can uh, reduce the complexity or the need for complex or precise navigation and control, right? So even if the height is not perfect, it's still able to attach to it. And this is basically, if you can conceptually see, it can be the intelligence of the adaptability of the anchor or of the string compliance to make this adhesion to the environment. Right? And I think this is a quite interesting idea to uh, benefit from the mechanical nature of tensile elements to do those type of tasks. So <laughs> going from biology to um, superheroes is, I think, also an interesting step. So we don't have to be limited to biology, right? So you can look into superheroes. And Spider-Man is one of my favorite ones. And because Spider-Man can actually shoot the anchors and then use that to move or jump through the environment. And so in this work here, we um, took an approach of using a full autonomous, fully autonomous system that does onboard um, 
processing, can detect environment, navigate its trajectory, so more in a classical sense, um, and then can it put an anchor, attach an anchor and use an admittance controller to pull back and perch down to be on the surface and like this, perch up and down, interact with the surface, manipulate the surface, and then take off again. Here, basically, it's a um, <coughs> switching controller approach of doing the navigation attachment and perching and then manipulation of the environment. So inspired from that, and this works in uninstrumented environments. So there's no Viking system. It's all onboard sensing, onboard computation. So here again, then we try to augment this kind of more classical approach with a level of intelligence on the mechanical manipulators. So for example, what if you want to attach yourself to something that you don't know how it looks like, like a branch of a tree, right? A tree branch is very three-dimensional, very complex. And so we developed this uh, microspine grapple system, which is passive, but by, um, because of the, actuation, uh, the design of the structure, it happens that when you pull on it, it self-tightens and has a directional adhesive. Like this, we can engage it with the environment in one direction. And when flying off in the other direction, it can peel off passively. Right? So it's a self-adapting mechanical device that allows it to, to perch to the structure without knowing the structure geometry. Right? But again, it's directional, so you can peel it off very easily on the other direction. So this, again, it's then a combination of the mechanical design, the mechanical grasping, or simple hand, as some people also call this, this kind of adaptation or morphological computation of the morphology, but then combined with an admittance controller, where we can then also use the control, uh, kind of the sensor input of the IMU, to measure the compliance of the environment. So it's a combination of these two worlds coming together into some system that hopefully can do things that a um, singular approach cannot do. OK, so now to something completely different, or to the question of what if we see something like this? And I'm not sure if you recognize this, but this was the Greenfell Tower fire in 2017, I think, um, which was a dramatic incident in London. Like, I think more than, 72, more than 72 people died in that. And I was actually at that time living in London, um, actually somewhere here in the back, and I was driving by to college every day. And I saw it was burning for days, actually. It was fuming for quite a long time. It was a I mean, very dramatic event. And at that time, um, I got a phone call, like, oh, do we have a drone that can fly inside and check for survivors, right? I mean, having the aerial robotics lab, right? People would think, you know, we have robots that can do that. But of course, we didn't have that. There are just commercial drones that can take pictures, but none that can go inside of the fire. And so this inspired the approach of um, developing robots that can fly inside of fire or in, in extreme hot environments. And there again, we can take inspiration from nature, how to do uh, thermal insulation, which can be done by the geometry, so the surface to volume ratio, very famous example, but also um, to different kind of heat uh, phase change based approaches that can insulate structures or cool down structures by having uh, phase changing gels or kind of gases or liquids, for example. And so by taking inspiration from that, we build this one here. It's called the fire drone. And it's basically, we call it a temperature agnostic robot. So it's a robot that can fly and survive extreme hot and extreme cold environments. It uses a, a structure that is uh, compartmentalized, as you, you see here, which has a, a CO2 canister that can uh, open and like this cool down the internals of the drone. It has a shell that is made of aerogel and the aerogel is this extremely high um, insulation material, very lightweight insulation material that consists of 95, 99% of air um, that we developed specifically for that um, because it's, um, we had to develop it because it has also not just thermal but also structural properties for the robot. So we wanted the shell to be structural and thermally insulated. So it's a new types of polyamide, glass fiber reinforced polyamide aerogel that was uh, developed for this project specifically with our partners um, from material science. And also it has a different configuration of the motors not being at the periphery of the arms as usually they are in quadrotors, but at the center of the body and having gearboxes that then translate it. We then have some level of sensing, visual sensing, thermal sensing, and then have basically a system that can look like this and can 
fly through the environment, sense different like survivors or thermal maps, and like this uh, survive those extreme environments. Now, this made me actually very happy, this project, once because it combines material science with robotics, but also um, because it shows that robots could be those type of supportive, life supportive or life saving agents in those environments. And also because this is this physical AI based approach where we had to co evolve the materials, so the polyamide aerogel, with the design of the robot. So it wasn't a, like we take the material off the shelf and apply it to the robot. It needed to be co-evolved all along, all along as we had the project. And so this is a good example of this material science and robotics coming together. <clears throat> okay. So now what else could they do that is life supportive or kind of can help in, in dangerous environments? And one of them is the idea to augment or help in construction. So construction is one of the most dangerous sectors um, in manufacturing. Many people die at height, so working at height is extremely dangerous. And also the construction sector is very traditional and slow to adopt new technologies compared to other sectors. Um, and so we came up with this idea to use robots uh, to do 3D printing, so do manufacturing with them. So 3D printing drones, where basically the drone is used as a printing head to then collectively deposit materials and build up larger structures. So of course this can happen in space where you, know, you want to maybe harvest the materials from the environment to print, but also on Earth where humans, ground robots and aerial robots want to work together to an ecosystem of those type of systems. And so um, the big challenge here or the big um, change in approach is, is that 3D printing is used a lot in construction or it starts to be used. And there are these big crane based 3D printers, but they typically can only print something that is smaller than the 3D printer, right? So if you want to build a house, you need a 3D printer that is bigger than the house. And so that can be problematic. So the idea to have mobile agents to do it um, can bring value and can be more modular more easy to bring on site and so on. But also there we need to benefit from the way how it is done. And so we looked into nature, into collective construction in nature, and we wrote this paper in 2019, um, also with Daniela together, um, looking at this uh, method of collective construction and what we can learn from the animal kingdom. And there's a few learned lessons that we have taken from this. One is that if you want to build something large, so like a structure to animal ratio being uh, large, right, so something big, we typically have to use a lot of agents, right, so it correlates. So the bigger the structure, the more agents you need. And the second is that there are certain principles that we can copy from nature, such as, for example, using templates and template a construction where you build something and then you have an, uh, like an impulse or kind of a a low level rule of building based on what is already there. So it's a, rather than a blueprint and a kind of centralized controller of building, it can use a local um, communication and local decision making, which where the communication happens through the change of the environment. So Stigmergy, for example, is a very good example where um, the animals use the environment to communicate the next step in the construction. So a lot of these things we can benefit from conceptually in robotics to make those types of systems that um, can do this autonomously. <clears throat> okay, so I think it's this. So the robot we build is this. Um, it's basically a flying platform. It has a delta arm manipulator that can stabilize the printing head. The printing head then extrudes, in this example, cementitious material which is also custom developed for, uh, for this project. So it's a um, non-Newtonial fluid that gets extruded, gets um, hard just in the right rate so that we can make layers, but it's still buildable enough that we can extrude it. Um, so it's a high performance cementitious material done with the partners on the material science here as well, allowing us to 3D print those type of geometry using a piano curve approach. And all of this um, by having it all on board and printing it in a, 
uh, open loop manner here. So here it doesn't uh, perceive what it has printed, it just deposits it and the material deposition rate is predictable enough that it can build that uh, quite precisely. So it's 27 layers, I think, in this example, showing that it can be done, right? It can be, um, so it's a proof of concept. Now, what if we have a material that is less predictable, like, for example, polyurethane foam, as you see here. So you spray it and it expands in some weird way, right? As you spray it, it's a very complex process. And so how can we build something on this? And for that, we um, integrated a scan drone where the printing happens in one step, but the scanning happens in the next step then uh, identifying the structure it has printed and like this adapting the trajectory of the next printing step to make the structure that you want to make. So this type of um, multi-agent closed loop 3D printing right, is needed because of the uncertainty of the flight process. Right? It's not like a ground-based printer, it's a flying system that is influenced by all possible things. And second, because of the unpredictability of the material deposition and the behavior of the materials. You cannot assume that it stays where you put it. And so because of that, I think this is a key aspect of aerial additive manufacturing, to have the scanning in the loop and the adaptation of the trajectory of the next printing step in the loop as well. So here then, uh, it can build this in a scalable manner. So 72 layers of polyurethane foam. We also stopped at two meters, just out of time reason actually but it could uh, keep on going doing that. So what then uh, you, about using many of them? What if you want to build something one kilometer high, for example? And so for that, we studied also multi-agent trajectory adaptation where the printing step is informed by the overall structure design and also the position of the other agent. So it's a multi-agent framework that adapts and assigns tasks to the different agents alongside of the printing process. So it's not just locally adaptive with the scan, but it's globally adaptive, adaptive with the multi-agent system that can do that. So this paper also made me quite happy for some reason, because also it includes this uh, architecture with the material science, with the robotics all coming together. And actually there's quite a big group of uh, people that uh, contributed to that. So it was a very important uh, piece of work for us to show that this co-evolution of disciplines really is important and needs to happen to make such uh, things a reality. And so if you want to see the robot, uh, it's still uh, now exhibited actually at the Architecture Biennale in Venice. Uh, there's a, every two years there's a big Biennale in Venice uh, on different new architecture systems. And so we have a room there where we also show how architecture now can be transformed with this idea of using multi-agent systems to print larger structures. Okay, so last example for today that I want to, would like to share with you um, is the idea to use robots that would not just fly and do interaction, manufacturing, sensing, but robots that would, uh, or drones, flying drones, that would not just be flying drones, but also be fish, right? Also be <laughs> underwater vehicles. So systems that can fly and then transition back into water, fly out of water again. So that's uh, the project here. And so, uh, in fact, it's something we work on for about 10 years and to do water health monitoring in the Arctic, coral reefs, catchment area modeling, environmental DNA. These are all big topics in environmental sciences around water. And so if you think about, you know, animals that do these transitions, there are quite a few. Some are this type of birds, right, that dive into the water, then get very happy with the fish that they can catch, let's say. And then they try to fly out again. And then you see what happens at the interface, right? It's very hard to get out of water, right? It's very hard to fly out and like this, this transition and the kind of the multi-aid, the multi-flow physics of that is extremely complicated, right? So you want to build a robot like this necessarily, you might not necessarily take the approach of wings, right, that do this. So there might be other, <laughs> eventually managers, but, but it's quite challenging. So in fact, there, the physics is, not trivial, not just because of the individual fluids, but because of the transition and air and tra entrapment and kind of the multi-flow physics of this. So we try to model this and try to understand the dynamics and the trajectory and the energetics of those type of locomotion patterns, the transition between air and water. So one example that we have built is a kind of water animal, uh, water robot, that then flies out of air 
uh, out of the water into the air and then back to the water. So it's water-based. It's not air-based, right? It's, uh, you could be, have the flying fish or the diving bird, right? So it depends where the focus is. So this is one that lives in the water and then floats, then uh, takes the water in the body and then ejects the water with high force by using combustion, um, jetting the water out, then gliding and then retaking the water again, refilling and like this uh, moving over obstacles in the water. So the approach is actually inspired conceptually from the flying squid. And I'm not sure if you've seen flying squid, but they're pretty amazing. They can like jump out of water, deploy soft wings, like this jump glide on the water surface. Flying fish do something similar. So in 2019, we had this paper we did, um, where we basically use a combustion chamber. We take a bit of water into a chamber of calcium carbide. This then creates acetylene gas. Um, the, the body is closed here, so it's an open tube, but it closes as it fills up. So we have a certain fixed volume, which we then fill with calcium, with this acetylene gas, creating a near stoichiometric mix, which is uh, uh, ignited and then ejects the, the water out of the robot's body. So because of this, we can then model the, um, the physics of this combustion, uh, kind of measuring the, also the force it creates and the jetting dynamics. Uh, we can also model this as a, um, a diabatic system. And like this, can measure the force. We can model the internals using unsteady Bernoulli, for example, and the externals, looking at the typical equations to estimate the drag. So like this, we can optimize the overall system design. And we can optimize the thruster dimensions and geometry uh, to get the maximum kind of height or kind of trust and uh, specific impulse of the overall design. This then we can compare to the measurements, so the model of the trajectory model to the measurements, and actually compares quite okay. So we can use this type of physics to do this type of estimation. Eventually we end up with a system like that, that let's say lives in a park, here it's a London park actually, and then jets out by collecting water from this uh, quite unclean water here, right? So it does the jetting of the water, then you see a bit of spray, which happens at the end, and then the gas jet, you've seen maybe a bit of uh, dark gas, and then it does the gliding. So it jumps a distance of about 23 meters um, with one jump from underwater using 0 0.3 grams of calcium carbide. So it is a quite high power density that uh, this type of combustion process has. So we were quite happy with that, um, being able to do this transition quite, um, in a quite powerful way on those type of small systems by also understanding the physics involved. Here, related work um, a little bit before that, that was done also, I mean, led by Rob Wood's lab and also by uh, Kevin Chen, so a gentleman here. So he's also faculty here at MIT now doing great work. Um, but here the approach was to have a Robo B, uh, familiar with the Robo B at Harvard, right? Um, now engaged not just for underwater swimming and air swimming, uh, flying in air, but also having a um, hydrolysis-based approach of creating hydrogen and oxygen and igniting that to jump out of the water and like this um, jump quite high and being able to transition from underwater to air. So it is also very exciting work. Okay, so another example here, um, this paper and collaboration is led by um, Lee Wen at Beihang University. And so uh, Lee's group, um, who was also posted at Harvard, by the way, um, at about the same time, so, but he's now in Beihang developing those type of adhesion mechanisms, so the remora adhesion mechanisms, that are basically combining a soft adaptation with the lamella-based approach of being very robust to different unperfect surfaces. And this can then be integrated on a flying vehicle, allowing it to hitchhike through the environment. So like this, it can fly, attach to surfaces, attach to underwater vehicles, like this, move through the environment. So it actually works quite well, even if the surface is you know, not flat or it's saw, is wet or has holes, porosity, like this, uh, being able to transition between air, water, and um, by hitchhiking, like this, reducing energy consumption. Another approach, just briefly to mention, is the idea to use not just flying, but also sailing as a form of energy harvesting. So what if your body can not just be rigid, but the metamorphosis can help it to um, you know, use environmental vectors like wind 
to then move at low energy costs. So instead of attaching to, to do hitchhiking, attaching to animals or to underwater vehicles, uh, we see actually that swans use that too. So they sail, actually, I didn't know that. But apparently swans sail, there's a paper that says this. And also spiders, there are some spiders that use the legs in air to sail over the water surface. I mean, this is very exciting, right? Because like this, you can reduce the energy cost of moving through the environment. So we looked at that and thought, well, can we have a reconfiguration space of a flying vehicle that can fly and then land on the surface, reconfiguring the wings into sails, and like this, sail on the water surface. Now we call this sail mouth, sailing microair vehicle that you see here. It's basically now in its sailing mode. It has a custom sail controller on PX4. Uh, full custom electronics, custom design, I mean the whole configuration, it's all optimized in CFD as well. So then we integrate all of this in a sailing controller and allowing the vehicle to um, kind of transition from water to air. And this itself is also quite complex because you have first a displacement regime, then you have a hydroplaning regime, and then you have the takeoff regime. So, so the physics of this type of takeoff at this scale is very much not understood. So we did a lot of water, water tunnel tests for figuring out the particular geometry of the hull, for example, to get the right features at these Reynolds numbers to do that properly. So it's actually not so easy. But um, again, the sailing can really help in reducing the energetic cost of transport. And one thing I would like to emphasize here is that it's, like if you think about hybrid robots, right? They can do sailing and flying or perching and flying or, you know, these kind of multi-terrain multi locomotion capabilities, I think what is important is to look at the cost of the hybridization. So how much do you pay for the ability to be able to swim, right? If you think of it as a drone. So if you just take a drone, you slap a kind of a boat to it, right? It will do it, but you pay the most, right? Because there's no shared functionality. So here, if you look at this, if you think of it as a flying system that is now able to sail, it's only 10% more heavy because of the actuators compared to just flying. If you think of it as a sailing system, it's only 20% more heavy to be able to fly. And this type of shared morphology and features, I think, is very key in case you want to develop this type of multimodal system. So to share as much as you can of the system. And so this paper also made me quite happy because um, basically we showed that this system can be used uh, how, like between air and water, right? We focus on the water first, now doing experiments more on the flying side, but also because it can be used in outdoor environments. And so here's a test we did like a year or two ago in Croatia in a, in a lake uh, where we did autonomous sailing over several kilometers using the sailing controller. So, um, and it does work even though there are other imprecisions of the environment like the waves that influences the sailing, but it does work and it can be used to monitor the biodiversity in those environments. Actually, we did use it to monitor the bioacoustics of the environments. And we were able to show that it can go to places that other robots or humans will not be able to, to monitor. So there was a group of ecologists and they told us, well, you know, you have to monitor this, you know, if you identify this species. But it was, they were not able to do that themselves because they would fly away. So this type of robots can mingle with the with the species, with the birds, and being silent like this, being able to detect certain things that kind of manual tools cannot. And I think this is really the key and something very exciting that, we, that the whole field can develop more of having hybrid societies of robots and animals together and like this get information on them. So these are some examples. We work actually for 10 years on this. thing. So we have a family of different types of aerial aquatic vehicles. Some that I haven't mentioned include the aquamath, so the second from below, that can fly, dive in, and then jet out with folding wings, or others that land on the surface and can move underwater as well. Ah, yes, we also published a book last year on this. Um, so if you're interested in more details on that, so please uh, buy this for Christmas. It's on Amazon <laughs> if you want. Yeah, great. So what I want to emphasize is that what I would like, what kind of inspires me and I think the group is to go from a concept, so a new concept, like a sailing flying vehicle, to the design, to the laboratory tests, to then the outdoor validation, but also then to not just stop there, but also collect the data 
and then based on this data get the insights in environmental sciences and in ecology. So if you are able to do the full story, right, from, from the idea of a new type of robot to the insights of ecosystems, right, I think that's the holy grail as if you are able to do that. So this is where the fusion happens. We're having new capability, new methodology for environments, and like this getting new insights using new robots. Okay, so from bio-inspired uh, robots to superhero-inspired robots, now we're working on God-inspired robots here. <laughs> so, and what you see is uh, here, this is Proteus. Proteus is one of my favorite figures from Greek mythology, and Proteus is able to change its shape and like this move on land and in water, right? It's also uh, used to be, you know, dealing with the adaptive nature of, na uh, adaptive nature of the environment and of water by changing its shape, so it's a metamorphic uh, god. And inspired from Proteus, we are now uh, developed a new project that we call the Proteus Drone, where basically it's a vehicle that can fly in air, move underwater, and move on the water surface, all by reconfiguring its morphology, its body, and having fully soft structures that can become rigid if needed, soft when needed, and have embedded sensors and proprioception, and control to do this metamorphosis, allowing it to move in air, water, on the surface as well. So this is the project that just started. It's funded by the, US, uh, by the ERC grant uh, by SERI in Switzerland um, to, to do that. So we are pushing that hard, and I'm very excited about this project too. So with this, I would like to thank uh, all the people involved in the lab. And especially, I would like to um, acknowledge all the alumni uh, that are now faculty around the world that really I'm very thankful for all the support. And so we also now just celebrated 11 years it's been Imperial College and EMPA. And so I'm very thankful to you all as well to listening. But before I stop, I would like to just show you, show, say a few words about EMPA because I'm not sure if you have heard a lot about it. So EMPA is a, I also like to <laughs> thank the funders of course. So thank you very much. But EMPA, so EMPA is a material science institute in the ETH domain. So ETH domain in Switzerland has, is a government-funded institution that has two universities, ETH Zurich, EPFL, and has four institutes. One of the institutes is um, on material science and technology. It's called EMPA. And it's very strong in fundamental chemistry, material science, but also in components such as this type of soft centers, but also in applications like smart fabrics or soft robotics and so on. So in 2019, uh, we set up a joint uh, center between Imperial College and EMPA. And so we built this infrastructure drone test bed here, 1,000 meters cube, where we have a large projection screen. We have a wind turbine blade standing inside of the room. We also have a bridge and water tunnels, so we can test all types of robots across those type of infrastructure systems. So all of this, of course, can be used in collaboration too. So if you have any needs for these type of things, uh, please reach out. And there's one initiative that uh, we are developing now, which uh, we call the Drone Hub, and uh, which I'm very excited about. And basically what you see here, it's called the Nest Building. So the Nest Building is an experimental building where different units can be built to study innovations in building technologies. So for example, the wooden structure here is a wood unit that uses new type of functionalized wood, like magnetic wood, hydrophobic wood, and so on, to make the whole apartment from wood. And it's not just that, it's also people live inside of that. So it's like an inhabited living lab using new building technologies. The black structure is the Hilo, which also is a new type of innovation in terms of architecture and how to build roofs. And this is currently the headquarters of, our, of the lab. So I'm very thankful for that. I'll offer you coffee here when you come. Uh, to visit. And next to this here, this yellow structure is um, uh, currently empty, which is an opportunity for a new unit. And the new unit we are proposing is uh, the drone hub. And the drone hub will be a netted structure that will be enabling new uh, study and validation of new systems, aerial systems for manufacturing, such as this uh, 3D printing wall where we can do repair and manufacturing using various robots. Then the second being the biodegradable robots, so an e uh, biosphere where we can test the robots biodegrading. And the third being the interface with the uh, facade to do cleaning, sensor placement, and uh, manipulation tasks. So all of this um, 
would be basically these three parts on the facade linking to the perching work, right? Spider-inspired manipulation. Then the biodegradation on the multi-materials and robots coming together. And then the continuation of the 3D printing with drones, doing side-based cantilever manufacturing, multi-agent uh, manufacturing, and so on. So this uh, is not a fantasy. It's actually going to open next year, early next year. So we're building it at the moment. And as well, this is a, a platform and opportunity to collaborate. So we have 1,000 visitors per month. So it's more like a showcase environment. Um, so it's a very um, good space to really test and showcase and validate these types of robots. So uh, one last pitch here is on NPJ robotics, you know, science robotics. Now Nature Portfolio Journals, uh, partner journals, um, so um, created a new journal called NPJ Robotics that I'm one of the board members of. And so this, the first issue just came out, I think a few days ago or today or yesterday. So have a look at this if you're interested. It's a uh, quite high impact uh, journal, hopefully. It will get, I think, more traction in the community. So if you're interested to submit something around those topics of physical AI, embodied intelligence, please submit, uh, keep that in mind. And with this, I would like to thank you. I would like to emphasize that autonomous drones can quantify the biodiversity. Um, Bio-inspired methods can help in new capabilities to do perching, interaction. Metamorphosis can increase robustness and functionality. And physical AI is the method to co-evolve them. So we cannot think in silos. We have to have multidisciplinary co-evolution of things, not just in collaboration, but also within their own groups. So ideally, the same group has the same different people from different disciplines working tightly together. So with this, I hope, um, hope you can join us in the journey of sustainability robotics. Thank you very much for your attention. That is part in talk. Thank you so much, Mirko. So, yep. very, uh, very impressive talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. One is a quick one. Uh, you have this robot which is jumping out of the water, right? I assume in some cases it would be more efficient to go down before going up, like a dolphin does. Wow. Uh, I was wondering if it's something that you've considered. And then a, an, another question was uh, if you take albatross. So albatross fly about 800 kilometers a day just you know from uh, basically uh, exploiting the the wind shear profile and actually they are kind of sailboats uh, except they don't have uh, they don't have uh, foldable sails they actually work as a sail when they go when they are up and they work as a keel when they're down and so that's how they get the energy from the so i was wondering if it's something that you've considered you know because that's the, it's really impressive you know yeah, the, the, thank you for mentioning that. So the, the kind of getting momentum from motion to jump out, I think the acceleration phase underwater is quite key to get out faster. But the question we're interested in, and we don't have the answer to that yet, is what is the optimum locomotion pattern, right? Is it best to be static, accelerate, jump out, or is it better to just swim underwater or just fly or jump glide or cross the water surface in some particular manner? For that, we need to get the insights on the physics first. So we model this with a closed loop model. And then we'll develop a simulator. And then we'll um, be able to study different configuration spaces and optimas within environmental kind of changes and obstacles, as well as with the configuration space of the body itself. The soaring question is very interesting, but we are, we're not working on this at the moment. Uh, people have done that. And I think it has a lot of potential to use soaring too. But I think gliding or jump gliding, the idea to do propelled gliding, a uh, propelled flight and then gliding flight, so intermittent locomotion, I think is very powerful too. So it links to the yeah. physics of trend. Because I think with all the expertise you accumulate on building devices, that would be a very natural one. You know, so like. I mean, my postdoc was on intermittent flight in butterflies, actually. Mm -hmm. So it is exactly this question, but it's, it's not clear where the optimas are. It has to be linked to some non-linearity in terms of the dynamics of it which is a soaring uh, kind of a turbo can be that, but it can also be other features on the flight dynamics. It's quite complex. Thank you. Um, thank you for the great talk. I have a question regarding the sensing. So first of all, you presented about the fire drawing inspired by the actual fire. And I, I wonder, well, although the outside is in, insulated by the 
the, some kind of silver, silver part. And I wonder whether the sensor is also or okay in that condition. For example, if there's a fire, then it is it might be difficult to detect the person by using IR sensor. So I wonder whether you also develop those kind of some specialized sensor. And also, in the forest example, you presented about some pH meter by using some rhythmus. Then is do you assume that there's another drone it will will fly again to detect the color of the the rhythmus, or is is it also connected? Uh, there's is the sensor also attached in that case and then transmitted to another place? Mm. Yeah. So the rhythmus uh, idea is that another drone would visually detect the change, but it's just a concept, right? It was more fundamental of how to do actuation, sensing, and so on, uh, with fully biodegradable methods. Yeah. So that was the idea there. In terms of the fire, like thermal cameras, we don't develop them ourselves. So you, there, there are some though that are more heat resistant and so on, that are smaller. So we integrate those and we shield them with thermal glass and this heat protection. So yeah, we just study the sensor performance rather than developing new sensors. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. So. I have basically two questions um, about the hugging a uh, drone, which was like kind of hugging the tree. So like what kind of material you're using to like change from like straight position to another position? And like does the drone autonomously detecting like I am about to land and then how much like how you're changing the like shapes using electromagnetics or electricity passing electricity or heat? Okay, that's basically here. You said there's a composite, the carbon fiber, then we have a polyamide and the latex rubber here, and then the carbon fiber. And then we have a triangular di kind of design of the arm, where there's a structure and then two arms. And so it's, it's rigid when mm -hmm. it's in this configuration. Then we have an actuator that opens it. It then becomes flat, and then because of the pre-tensed latex rubber, pre-stretched latex rubber, it then folds and hugs or kind of actuates it. So like does the does the drone like detects that I'm about to land or I have something to land and then like they change it? I think in this paper not. I think the here the focus was on the mechanical design, but of course we could include some kind of visual algorithm to detect the tree trunk, right? And even estimate the distance and then use this kind of in accordance to make the attachment make dynamically. The attachment. It is something we are working on uh, on the dynamics to make it transition uh, dynamically, so very fast. Like this, use even the flight momentum to attach itself. I think that has some merit too. Yeah. Also, uh, also quickly, I have another question. Like uh, uh, the next drone, you show that it kinds of like grab uh, grab a target location to fix it itself to attach to it some wall. Yeah. So this one. So uh, like here, does it like? Does it randomly grab a place or it detects like this is the place I want to grab and then I want to grab that place? Mm -hmm. And secondly, like does it consider like how much friction I'll get there or compliance model or something like that? That my target location is uh, like how my target location will be and how I can grab it uh, with my manipulator. Um, yeah, so the trajectory of the drone is using a Viking system and the pre-programmed trajectory. So it, the focus here was not on the autonomy, mm -hmm. but it was about showing the imprecision of the flight. So even if you don't get it perfectly, right, even if you change the height, so it's quite robust to the imprecision in height and still is able to grab itself mm -hmm. passively to the, to the structure. So that was the focus there. Um, and then, yeah, then we use an admittance controller to estimate the compliance of the structure. So it can use it to estimate the force, but even then it can be used to estimate the environmental compliance. And I think that's quite interesting, right? To be able to use onboard sensing um, to kind of get some insights onto the environmental performance. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your retard. Uh, I have a might be simple question. Uh, uh, those robots, especially the, the the robot jumping from water into the air, I I was wondering what kind of controller you used in those kind of flat, uh, very complicated processes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we use a switching controller. So we have different controllers that can have um, different criteria of transitioning between them. 
Yeah. So so when so in so in inside one face, the controller is just a, a linear controller or some other things. Um, <coughs> the loose, we, we look into different different methods. Um, so it's a feedback control approach. So it's not a, uh, um, MPC. It's a, just a feedback controller like PID controllers that can do a lot of it actually. But then it still becomes uh, quite specific to the morphology. And if the morphology changes, then this controller also needs to change. So the more uh, degrees of freedom the body has as such, right, the more the controller needs some level of adaptability, which we also build in, in addition to the controller switching to have fully different classes of controllers across the domain. I see. Thank you. Maybe I have uh, one more. I was also going to ask about the controller, but I think uh, they asked already. More of a philosophical question. So there is the human in the loop, like you know, in the design or co-evolution of these platforms. Do you hope to, at some point, take the human out of the loop and have the robots evolve on their own, like you know, maybe either in simulation or in the real world, like you know, have something that uh, maybe reinforcement learning style that is designing, like you know, on its own and is improving over time. Yeah, I think that there's an opportunity for that. So actually, maybe connect to some of the work we did when I was postdoc here with Rob, right? So we we looked into. Um, butterfly species from the Natural History Museum here at Harvard. And then we identified them and we simulated them and then we tried to build robots and others try to understand the performance of different shapes. But eventually we also looked into using different algorithms to evolve the shape, right? To get some kind of super um, above nature performing type of robotic shape, right? And I think this has uh, some, it's very interesting to do that. So you can evolve the morphology of the robot to be optimized, going even beyond um, and above natural systems. Because natural systems are also just some frozen moment in time. So in 50 million years, maybe they would look completely different. So maybe we can make a step change and jump directly there. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you.